Utica, um, the original TOC, 4% total or so, and probably most of that was really hydrogen rich and could have been an excellent uh, source for petroleum and oil and natural gas. Um, although this diagram assumes that some proportion of that initial TOC, which could have been oxidized, or in the case of younger deposits would be um, terrestrial in origin, that only a proportion of that is convertible to hydrocarbons. And um, based on study of a number of units, uh, Dan Jarvey has come up with this kind of formulation. So um, expects that of the hydrocarbons, if they were buried deeply enough for the right amount of time at the right temperature, that uh, about 60% of them would be uh, converted to oil plus some gas, and that would be expelled from the formation during compaction, migration into adjacent units, through faults or fracture systems, and that could be both to units below and above, uh, depending on the time units and how much porosity there is impermeable. About 40% is typically retained. And, um, this would be, you know, maybe on the order of two thirds oil and one third gas. Um, oil, the oil window um, starts at about 60 degrees centigrade and it goes on below that. I'm not sure I, I put those numbers anywhere in this, in this uh, presentation. But as temperature increases, possibly through depth of burial or an increase in the thermal flux from the floor of the basin, um, that oil begins to be cracked, broken down to gas. And the gases that are formed are methane, for one, a lot of methane, right, CH4, but also uh, the natural gas-associated liquids. So there are uh, C1 through 5 hydrocarbons. So the C2 through, through 5s, propane, butane, ethane, etc., are really valuable but they take certain treatment. They have to be separated, fractionated, and um, taken out of the gas pipe. But those have significant value uh, if they're present. So you have a mixture of gases as higher and higher temperatures are reached. Ultimately, depending on the temperature, those gases could persist or the C2 through 5 could be further cracked, partly to methane, or oxidized by other reactions. And what you're left with is dry gas, which is actually char characteristic of most of the um, Marcella shale in the central to eastern um, Pennsylvania region. The natural gas liquids are only present in sort of western counties, like the Creek, et cetera. And so, uh, although they're very important, that, that's telling you something. So these, um, the fact that in the Marcellus shale, which is thousands of feet above the Utica, that all we're seeing is dry gas. And there's actually evidence that that dry gas is being um, uh, cracked or, or oxidized based on stable isotope studies, which I won't bore you with. But um, the fact that that's occurring in Marcellus suggests that the Utica, five to 7,000 feet below, is of no value. That most of that gas has been converted to carbon dioxide. Uh, and it wouldn't be perspective to drill to those great depths. That's my prediction. I don't know if I'm going to be right. I'll be retired before anybody knows for sure. Um, and anyway, so that's where we're at. So what do we? have here. This is the Marcellus, and this is using vitronite reflectance, and the red <coughs> about here, from here this way, um, which mostly is in the fold belt, but includes a little bit up in here, that's what uh, Terry Engelder would call the line of death, that this um, part of the Marcellus shale is experienced higher than normal temperatures and deeper burial, and the companies that have uh, tried uh, drilling in this region have not come up with economically uh, viable wells, particularly in Wayne County and uh, uh, 
concern. And so uh, one could expect that even though the Utica is there, it's not going to be perspective either. As one moves out into the center of the basin, we probably come into more of a perspective region for Utica in terms of dry gas. It's still thousands of feet below the Marcellus Shale. But as we go farther west, and that's the limit of the Marcellus, um, as we go farther west, the Utica becomes even potentially better. People have tried to model this. This is uh, uh, Rowan's USGS um, model. It's a time temperature dependent thing, and it's in a cross section from uh, West Virginia up into Ohio, from the Allegheny Front of West Virginia. And you can see that today, we're right at, this would be the top of the dry gas zone. So any hotter in the Utica would probably be not respected. And this is uh, from uh, Bob Ryder's work at the USGS, based in part on Rapetsky's work on the uh, Canada alteration index, and these are so-called isograds. So they take all their samples, do the color alteration index, and they come up with a number that's assigned to this. It's a classification scheme, and then the contour of those data. The points aren't shown here, um, but you can see um, that five, for example, is too high. Okay. Countdown alteration index of five puts it kind of out of the run for um, much in the way of hydrocarbons. There may be some dry gas there, but it's not going to be economic. As one comes down to four and three and so on, then that becomes more perspective, and we'll see how that sorts out. Western limit of the Utica source rock, okay? and these are contoured TOC values, which are mythical. They're, there's just not enough data to really say, but they're also the maximum TOC, so not necessarily the best. Um, the only really, uh, there are two sources of data, one from Ohio and uh, the New York in my CERTA. These are the data that are available for uh, organic carbon and pyrolysis results. Now this is remaining hydrocarbon potential measured in milligrams of hydrocarbon per gram of rock. And if we wanted to see a really good potential source rock, we want it to be, you know, up in this region. And what this is saying is that for all these New York samples, which are from the Marcellus Fair or the Utica Fairway, those have been cooked well into the dry gas, they've lost all their potential to generate more hydrocarbons. So what you see there in terms of gas in place is what you get, no more. And you know, there are a lot of Marcellus values just like that in the Pennsylvania basin. Okay. So these are not, um, have no more generating potential, they're mature, over mature, and in the dry gas zone. That's not true of, uh, of Ohio, this would be the case that we're talking about here for uh, uh, eastern Pennsylvania, dead carbon, no more generating potential, and the gas all kind of exhausted. This is more likely what most of the unit is going to be. But this is the most likely economic zone. Dry gas in sort of Western Pennsylvania, predicted to be in that narrow zone, but good. And then you're going to see gas, NGLs, and oil. Once you get out into uh, this part, even if there was source bed there, it would be immature. It hasn't been buried deeply enough um, and experienced high enough temperature. So if we want to know what the uh, original Utica kind of looked like, we could go out here and study the Utica shale and project that. So that's, that's the basic uh, picture you report by the Patchen in West Virginia and others. Um, so Ohio looks like it has 
to me the best economic potential. The mustard most The Point Pleasant has the best. Now, we know that the Utica has actually been prolific. Bob Ryder and uh, Bob Burris and uh, Chris Lawford and others in surrounding units, and they have seen that um, the Utica Shale actually charged many of these units, including the Solarium of the Dino, which produced pretty well in Ohio. The Knox, Subnox, and uh, Trent probably has oil and gas from the Utica. So it certainly has generated, and hydrocarbons have migrated in the past. They're now pretty well sealed. The potential's only in uh, this region out here, probably. So here's the conclusion. The advantage to the play, and also the limitation, is that once the infrastructure is there for the gallery systems and pipelines for the Marcellus, then you've got it. That's the basis for what I've talked about today, plus some of